Okay. Uh, so it's 5.30 now. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, first of all, uh, hope everyone's studying is going well. Uh, hope everyone is, keep, is keeping calm, will keep calm and uh, do well on the exam. So uh, this session is being recorded and it will be uploaded onto YouTube. Um, I've got a couple of questions that people have sent in, uh, which I'll answer. Hopefully, Brienne and Christy and Amy and stuff like that are here. Um, and then I'll open it up just for people to answer questions. Um, first of all, uh, can I get a thumbs up? I'm assuming you guys can hear me. So can I get a thumbs up from one of you guys to, okay, perfect, good. Okay, good. Um, the other thing, one, thanks Nada. The other thing I'll get you guys to do just to make sure the chat is working for everyone. Uh, why don't you just put in your uh, town and province just as a small icebreaker and then we'll get going. Yes, we have, an, uh, we have an election going on. I love Vancouver. I've got a good friend who lives there. Oh, lots of people are from Toronto. Okay, wonderful. Wonderful, okay. Uh, so let's begin. Uh, oops, have to admit a couple more people. So, um, I do have you guys on mute, so, but feel free to unmute yourself and uh, ask questions. Uh, first question, so first I wanna go for some tips first. So, um, you know, everyone is, it's normal for you to be nervous for an exam. Everyone is nervous for an exam. And I don't know if it's better that you're writing it at home or if you go to a giant gymnasium like I did when I first started writing the exam, but it is very important to keep calm. And so, um, you know, especially if you're first time, it's normal to be nervous. And so what I suggest you do is that if you feel yourself getting nervous, just take seven deep breaths, seven being the target A1C for most people. And when you're nervous, um, I think Suresh, that's only you. Uh, other people have said that they, they can hear me. Uh, so what was I? Um, oh, so, Take seven deep breaths uh, to uh, calm down. And when you're anxious, your mind is going really far in the future. It's thinking, oh, what's this question? I'm gonna fail, then I'm going to be the laughing stock of my work, and then I'm gonna get fired, and then I'm gonna be homeless. So that's kind of the trick that your mind is playing on you. So what you wanna do is uh, take seven deep breaths and bring yourself back into the present. So you wanna focus on when, because you're writing from home, you want to take, take a deep breath and say, okay, hey, focus on three things you can see. I can see the screen, I can see my keyboard, I can see my hands. Then take another deep breath, name three things that you can smell, name three things that you can taste, name three things that you can feel. You want to use this kind of, uh, kind of like this uh, senses meditation to kind of bring yourself back into presence so that you're nice and calm and so that you can read the questions slowly. Yeah, another important part is to not waste too many time, too much time on one, on one particular question. You have 165 questions in 3.5 hours. So that's about a minute and a quarter per question. So remember, there's a lot of highlight questions on the exam, there's 25 to be precise. And even if you spend a whole lot of time on them and you get them right, you get exactly zero points for them. The same as if you got it wrong. If you skipped it and didn't answer it, you also get zero points. So time is your most important uh, time is your mo most important resource in the exam. So make sure that you're using it wisely. If you if there's a question that you're stuck on, just skip it. Don't worry too much about it. Maybe it's a pilot question. Another important part is you know, and this keep this is part of being calm as well, is that you wanna read the questions slowly. If you're really anxious, if you're really nervous, you're not gonna be able to read the questions slowly. You're gonna be jumping around, kind of making weird assumptions with the questions. So it's really important to read the questions slowly and carefully. You know, sometimes the question will ask, you know, what is correct? Sometimes they'll ask what is incorrect. I think they've gotten away from asking too many of those kind of like trick questions where, you know, what is the incorrect answer? But it's important to read the question carefully and look for those things. Uh, 
Um, another important thing is that there seems to be lots of like long list questions. So, you know, they'll give you a big long list, list for an answer. And if you can just kind of eliminate the ones that you know are wrong right away, it'll just save you a little bit of time instead of going and reading through everything. Yeah. So, yeah. Will we be able, yes, I am recording this. It should, when you went into the Zoom chat, it should have warned you that uh, we are actually recording. Yeah, and then I'll be uploading this onto YouTube as soon as it processes and is done. Um, that can take a couple of hours though. So uh, just to let you know. Yeah, so let's go on to our first question that uh, someone submitted is, uh, I'm gonna ask this Brianne here. Yep, I am. Oh, perfect. Wonderful. Hi, Brian. How are you doing hey. today? Good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Perfect. So, yeah. So your question was about how does potassium and insulin impact each other? So especially in the context of BKA. So I don't work in eMERGE, but what insulin does is that it drives potassium out of the blood and, and, and into cells. So you can actually use it to treat hyper... You can use insulin to treat hyperkalemia in an emergency department needed. Um, so, uh, so when you have a, when you're in DKA, you're in a state of ketosis and insulin resistance. Remember those ketones are acidic, they're, they make you resistant, resistant to insulin. So you're pump, usually to treat that, you have to pump quite a bit of insulin into the person. That can sometimes cause their potassium to become low. As well, someone with BKA is usually throwing up or maybe has diarrhea. So they've lost a bunch of fluids and they've lost, lost a lot of potassium that way. So um, therefore, sometimes uh, IV potassium is needed just to prevent them from going hypokalemic. Yeah. Uh, your, and your questions on insulin metabolism. So yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so first pass metabolism is the is a drug metabol is kind of like a drug metabolism thing. When we I meet some people, when we take drugs, uh, goes it gets digested, goes into goes through the portal vein into liver, and the liver actually deactivates a lot of drugs. So sometimes when you're using like an IV form of a drug, you have to use a lot less because you bypass that first pass metabolism. Um, but in terms of insulin, uh, you know, the elimination of it, it's through the liver and the kidney. But in terms of the exogenous versus endogenous insulin, the elimination is kind of, it, the, band, the body kind of handles it the same. The thing is with in endogenous insulin is that, you know, our kidney, our pancreas produces it and it's in a monomer form. It goes directly into the bloodstream. So it acts really, really quickly, but because it's in that monomer form, it gets degraded by enzymes really quickly as well. Whereas when we inject it from an injectable form, it goes not into the bloodstream, but just underneath our skin subcutaneously. And as I discussed in the pathophysiology lectures, insulin likes to form these really stable hexamers. Uh, these hexamers are really resistant to degradation. And by playing around with the uh, playing around with the um, kind of amino acid structure, you can make them really, really tight. You can make it like a rock hard diamond kind of like kind of like longer acting insulins. It's really, really rock hard. And so it takes a long time for that to dissociate and enzymes can't really get to it because it's in that hexamer form. They can't uh, break that insulin down. That's how you get like really, really long acting insulin. Um, supposedly there's this once a week insulin coming out, I, I, I kind of deck or something like that. That'll be really, really interesting to see and to see like, yeah, it, it's not, it's not yet, it's not yet out. It's not out yet. Don't worry. It's not on exam or anything like that. Yeah. I coke, I coke deck. Um, and, but yeah, it'll be really interesting to see how, you know, it's formulated and how do you adjust it, but that's for, that's for another, that's for another day. Uh, boom, 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 boom. And so basically, it's just generic lattice, so you can split those two as well. Yeah. Does that kind of answer your questions, Brianne? Yeah, that's great. I just, you know, sometimes you see different things um, in practice, so it's just nice to get the right answer, I guess. So. For sure. Yeah. Especially right before the exam. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, Christy, 
Uh, do you know the names of the oral and in the combination bits? Yeah. So in all the previous exam, like they used to at the beginning, like 15 years ago, they didn't. They only gave the generic name. In the last exams, they have given both. So um, yeah, I know it's complicated to Sinjardi and Jardi blah and stuff like that. But in the exams that I've written lately, uh, both names, both the generic and the brand name were provided. Hmm. Okay, uh, let's see here. Amy, Amy, are you here? Hi, yes, I'm here. Hi, Amy, how are you doing today? <laughs> good, thank you. Good, good. Hey, wonderful questions, by the way. Okay, so, um, this kind of comes up a this kind of comes up a lot. Uh, why did how does different things affect the A1C? So just to kind of review for everybody, um, the way I like to imagine it is that you know red blood cells are like donuts, and as your as they uh, kind of filter go, go in your bloodstream, if your sugars are high, it kind of like develops like a little glaze, and then the more sugar there is, the thicker the glaze. That's kind of how I explain to uh, patients and how I like to visualize it in my head. The real answer is that um, it's actually this complicated glycosylation of sugar onto the red blood cells. And that glycosylation is a chemical process that can be altered by a lot of different things. Uh, so for example, uh, things like vitamin C and E inhibit hemoglobin glycosylation. So it kind of inhibits that kind of glaze forming on and it can lead to a weird A1C results. Um, things and same thing with uh, and then things like aspirin and alcoholism and stuff like that that can apparently interfere with the assay used to test A1C, which can lead to false results. So that's kind of uh, why those things affect the A1C and can make it not uh, not accurate in those uh, cases. Yeah. Um, if there's ever and if there's ever a discrepancy between A1C and the home blood sugar monitoring, you always go to home blood sugar monitoring. Uh, A1C can be affected by lots of things. It could be lab errors or things like that. But if you have a consistent pattern at home, that's what you would that's what you would go with. If there was ever a discrepancy. Okay. Um, let's see here. Okay, so I'll answer, I'll get through these questions first and I'll, I'll get to the questions in the chat. Yeah, okay, so uh, there is this uh, link here, you can look it up more. Uh, reticulocytosis is generally an increased production of red blood cells. So usually if there's, um, you know, if for some reason those red blood cells are dying before the 90 days, then they don't have as much chance to collect that glaze. And so it'll be a falsely, decreased A1C. So, and lots of things can cause that, like iron deficiency anemia, uh, sickle cell anemia, those things. Those donuts don't have enough time to kind of collect that glaze from the high blood sugars. And then, and then so what happens is that there's not as much like oscillation and then there's a possibly uh, decreased A1C. Yeah. Okay, so Humulin 37. 3070. So um, Humulin 3070 is a combo of two really old insulins. So I, I, like for the pharmacists here, I don't think I've ever seen a prescription lately. I haven't seen a prescription for Toronto or Humulin R. Those are really old insulins where you have to take it half an hour before you, uh, before you eat. Um, it has more variability and stuff like that. Yeah, see, Athena's saying it's like super rare. And also, it's a combination of things like NPH or human N, which I think also no one has seen. Oops, there are always people I need to admit. Uh, human N, which is also super rare. Like now that most drug pro provincial governments uh, cover things like Levimir, Lantis, um, Tujeo, Traceba, I, I like never see human N or NPH. So, <laughs> we have one that doesn't change. There are some people like that. Some people get, they like the insulin they're on and don't want to change. And if it's working for them, yeah, that's totally okay. Um, but uh, yeah, so those two, I would never use them because I never, I would never prescribe NPH and I would never prescribe human R. So I definitely wouldn't ever prescribe a combo of them. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, so A7 is inhibitors and ARP. So these are some of the common ones, Voltase, Coversil, um, Micardis, Atacan, Dialvan. Again, both names are usually provided in the test nowadays. Um, I put this in here just for the non-pharmacists. Just, it just makes it easier just to memorize which ones are which. So uh, for kidney function and uh, in uh, heart, heart uh, CV issues, uh, you would do ACEs or ARBs generally. Yeah, and the same ones are used in heart failure. There might be specific ones that are maybe better in heart failure, but I'm not a heart failure specialist, and I believe any of them can be used in heart failure. Yeah, uh, does that kind of answer? Does you have any, any more questions or concerns about that, Amy? Well, it's very clear. Thank you so much. No problem. No problem. Okay. Um, okay, Rita, Rita, I believe I admitted you. I believe you're here as well. So let's use an example for this. Um, let's see here. So you have a patient, Dr. Stephen Strange. He's a busy brain surgeon, but his blood sugars are poorly controlled. Uh, he works from seven to seven and has one meal per day due to his busy schedule. He's not willing to change anything. He's kind of this arrogant guy. So he's maxed out on all other medications, but his sugars are like this. So what are some of the risks of putting him on basal insulin? Uh, I'll just get someone to just put it in the chat or you can unmute yourself. Am I frozen? No, okay, no, you're probably good. Okay, so the risk would be that he would go low while performing brain surgery, and we don't want, we definitely don't want that. So for this case, yeah, exactly. Thank you. Uh, so for this person, I wouldn't put him on a basal insulin. And you know, if you look in the guidelines, there is actually no no point where it says that you must use basal first. For example, when you look, oops, I have to get all this stuff. Like if you look at the recommendations of the, sorry, I just all these. I don't know if you can see them all. I have all these boxes in the way. This is not good. There we go. Okay. If you look at the recommendations in the guidelines, there's actually no point where it says you have to use basal first. So you can actually start with base with bolus first. Uh, some European guidelines actually mentioned that. Yes, exactly. I think in Europe, they start with bolus first. And to be honest, that makes sense to, to me, certainly for some certain professions. Like in Alberta, I treat a lot of people, uh, of truck drivers and stuff like that. And again, they're driving big semi-trucks. Usually they're not, you know, usually they don't have three square, square meals a day. Usually they're really busy uh, driving and stuff like that. So in that case, I've started a lot of truckers on just bolus at night with their supper meal. That way it, it treats their highs. Um, that way, and then in the morning when they're starting to drive again, all the insulin activity has been out of their, out of their system. So exactly, and the whole hype was during diving. So, you know, that applies to like, you know, airplane pilots, you know, anyone where they operate heavy machinery or driving, um, I would actually go with bolus first. We have also a lot of oil rig workers here in Alberta. So um, they operate a lot of heavy machinery and if their sugars are high. Then generally I start with bolus at night, depending on their schedule, but bolus with supper first instead of a basal. Yeah, and if you look here, there's actually no point where it actually says you need to do basal first. Okay. Okay. And that's all the questions that people uh, submitted. I'll look in the chat now. And then if you do have some questions, you can feel free to unmute. Uh, raise your, maybe raise your hand first so that we don't have a, so I know who went first. And then we'll go from there. Okay. And one of your questions metformin could be given even with an EGFR 20 in the appendix. So are you looking, I don't think you're looking at the right one. If you look at, if you look at the updated guidelines, they have a new chart and I put it right here under competencies. 
Where is it? Yeah, here we go. So 15 to 29, you can still use 500 milligrams once a day. So this is the updated chart. That old one in the old guidelines is uh, outdated. So don't memorize from that one. This one's also easier to use as well. Okay. Um, so I'm not sure who went got first, but um, Akil, uh, I'll get you to, to unmute and ask your answer, ask your question. Okay. Yeah, so thank you, first of all. Uh, my question was, if like somebody is already on LDL target of like two or less than two, mm -hmm. can we, to avoid the retinopathy or to reduce the risk, can we still use the phenofibrate on top of the statin? Um, I think you could. Uh, I haven't, I've never seen it used that way, uh, but technically I think you could. There was one time an optometrist said that, suggested, or, or it was an ophthalmologist, I think, yeah, who recommended phenofibrate just for the retinopathy. I can't remember if his LDL was that target or not, but even if it was, I would have started, I would have put him on phenofibrate anyway. So there is no risk of adding the phenofibrate on top of statin while their, like, uh, their cholesterol is within the range. I don't think there is. Um, we used to do that all the time, actually, if they were not a target for like triglycerides and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I, do, I don't think there's a da any danger in that. Okay, I have one, one more question. Yeah, like. sure. What's up? <laughs> yeah, the other question was like, I had a patient just a couple of days ago at the store. She's 88 and uh, she was being put on Jardians for her diabetes. Mm -hmm. She was just basically diagnosed not too long ago. Okay. And uh, she's not fully, you can't say like functionally independent, a bit of dependent, because she okay. uses, uses a bit of walker every now and then. And the doctor also was planning to start her on a statin. And I was like, should she be on a statin at 88? Or would statin like benefit her much? That's a good question. Um, it kind of depends on how much more lifespan you think she has. If she's like, if like statins help, you know, prevent stuff uh, like, you know, a while along the road. If you don't think she has that amount of time, then you're kind of just putting on a medication unnecessarily. Um, it depends, it depends on her lifespan. If she's like healthy, but like it, it depends on how long you think she has to live basically. Like I, I can give you a background. She, she's not on many medications. She's just takes Synthroid. She's otherwise mm -hmm. fairly healthy, no issues. And uh, just uses one Alendronate because of her osteoporosis, which is very well controlled. Her BMD is fine. So the only thing was like, it was a really hard one to discuss with her, like should because doctor obviously prescribed it. Mm -hmm. And when I'm talking to her, my thinking was like, I don't think that's necessary. You will, you won't get benefit from that. Mm -hmm. But I and I I had asked already the doctor before she came and I faxed in the doctor and doctor was like, whatever you suggest. So <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you have the power now. It's in your hands. <laughs> So uh, actually I was able to convince her. So I decided to put a hold for like next three months and see how you're doing with Jardians and how your A1C is doing and we'll go from there. So we were kind of like the two pharmacists that were there that day, we were discussing and everyone had a different opinion. One of us <laughs> wanted to start, I didn't want to start. So it was kind of like, okay, I was like, I'm not too sure there's yeah, no, that's a tough one. And that, that'll be up to clinical, that's one of those clinical judgment ones where you'll run into, like the guidelines can only cover so much, like they can't cover every corner case. Um, you know, if she's otherwise healthy and you expect her to kind of be stick around for a while, then I think it might be worthwhile. Um, but that's, that's tough, like she's 88. So really how much longer do you really expect? So that, that is a tough one. <laughs> 
Yeah, and uh, sorry, one more, and then I will ask you a question. Okay. Yeah, so for the ECG criteria at the baseline that we usually do like every three to five years, that's what the recommendation is for the diabetic patients. Mm -hmm. And age-wise, if somebody is like not like they they are not 30 or they haven't had diabetes for that long, with the additional like risk factors, do we still go for the ECG like based on the other criteria, like they're They've been diabetic, say, for 14 years. They they have type 2 diabetes. They're not, they still don't meet the criteria. But do we have to do the ECG every three to five years for that? Um, let me try to find that. I believe it's three to five years, even if they don't have any risk factors. So as long as they have diabetes, it's considered a risk factor. Yeah, if they're 30 and up with the 15-year diabetes, that one I know, but 40 and up for sure, you go ahead with that. Yeah. But if they have like risk factors, hypertension, they smoke, all other cardiovascular risk factors. So do we go ahead with the three to five years? Um, like if they didn't, if they don't have any risk factors? No, no. I mean, if they do, mm -hmm. but they don't have the duration of diabetes and they still don't qualify with the age too. Oh, I see. Um, hmm, that's a tough one as well. I I don't have I don't have a firm answer for that. It'd be kind of up to your clinical judgment. Like, if you think that wow, this person has like a huge family history, is a smoker, is obese, you you absolutely you could. There's nothing stopping you from suggesting it earlier. Um, yeah, so that's what I would go with. Like, if you feel that they are very high risk, it wouldn't hurt to do it earlier. Thank you. No problem. Okay, so. Um, I'll go to the chat first, and then in Samsung GM G99W, I'll get you after I get to through the chat. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. In the diabetes in Ramadan, it says to decrease basal by 25 to 50%. In the table, then in the recommendations, it says 5 to 50%. Uh, yeah, that's... It's kind of annoying how some of the guidelines are like they're kind of a little bit inconsistent, like even between guide between guidelines, because they're all if you look, they're all written by different people at different times independently. Uh, if it says in the recommendations for five to fifty percent, then that's probably yeah, what I would go what I would go with. Okay. Would bolus insulin would bolus insulin without basal insulin put them at risk of hypoglycemia, like using sliding scale in hospital long-term care? Um, not any more than not any more than putting them on basal insulin. So, so for a bolus insulin, what if I'm starting like a trucker or Doctor Strange at supper? They'd be taking it all the time. So. That, so a sliding scale is kind of a very re reactive thing where you don't give them insulin until they're really high. And then you give them a bunch of insulin when they're really high and, it go, and then it goes down really, then it reacts and goes down really low. So no, I don't think it would put them at risk of hypoglycemia of, for hypoglycemia, like using a sliding scale in hospital LTC because it's a regular, regularly scheduled insulin that you're taking with their meals. Yeah. Does that answer your question, Dura? Okay. When do you find that chart in the guideline under appendix? Okay. I'm not sure which one you're referring to, Rita. Um, okay. A2. There's conflicting info about SGLT2 inhibitors and reduction in MACE. Uh, I believe there's evidence for it, like Jardines reduces mace and stuff like that. Uh, the dreaded popsicle, <laughs> 15 grams. Um, let me see here. There is a, there's an, okay. So in addition to the Beyond the Basics poster, there's another one, there's another carb chart that I posted. Okay, let me just find it in the nutrition section. And that should have, the popsicle that should answer the popsicle question. Here it is. Okay, let's look for popsicle. 
There we go. Okay. So according to this, one bar is 15.6 grams. So, oh, it's half the bar. Um, this has the whole bar, so I go with the whole bar. Uh, can you confirm that we're, yes, I've seen the guideline, it's based on, you know, that update came out in like 2021, so it's 2023. So for bladder cancer, no, it has no dapagliflozin. You don't have to worry about cancer with dapagliflozin. Um, I don't think people get myopathy much with vino fibrates. Definitely with statins, but I haven't had a patient get complain about pheno, myopathy with pheno fibrate. <laughs> Just a good popsicle question. Uh, okay. What is the fluid replacement? Yes, it's uh, 15 grams per hour. And actually, it's on the Diabetes Canada. Just Google that. Diabetes Canada, speaking guidelines. I've always seen Windows here. And yeah, it's on this one, it says, no, I think it's on the website, I think. Anyway, it's 15 grams per hour is what I've seen. I've seen it somewhere on the Diabetes Canada website, 15 grams per hour. Yeah. Uh, Fiona, no, it'll be based on the, that one will be based on the, though that guy like didn't, like February 1st is the general deadline for new information, but I believe that guideline came out after it. So I would use the, uh, I would use the Canada, Diabetes Canada guidelines for that one. Okay. Uh, yes, that is correct. Only peel glitazone for the exam and in real life is associated with bladder cancer. A patient. Technically, yes, but so, but the question is, is that, you know, if she's 88, you know, it goes into polypharmacy and, you know, trying to prevent pe putting people on too many questions, too many medications. And so, you know, if they don't have a lot, if they're like, okay, for let's take it an extreme example, if they're palliative, then there's no point in putting them on a statin because they're not going to live long enough for them to be, to get any benefit from a statin. So in that case, you definitely wouldn't put them on a statin. You'd be giving them, you're giving them an extra medication and putting them at risk for myopathy for basically no good reason. Okay, Samsung SMG99W. I need a very, very clear role on the SGLT. Okay, so let's take a look at the, let's take a look at that guideline then. And I think Suresh, if you're here, we'll go over this as well. So, okay. Can everyone see this or should I, maybe I'll just blow this up a little bit more. Okay. So basically what this is showing is that here's MACE and here are the things that, uh, lowered risk in a reserve trial. So green is grade A, uh, this purple color is grade B, and then this blue is grade C or D, okay? So for people who have MACE and they have established cardiovascular disease, you can use GLP-1s or SGLT2 inhibitors. Now, the this is a little bit confusing because the issue is that you can't use all of them. So for the GLPs, you can use dulaglutide, which is trulicity, liraglutide, which is victosa, or semaglutide, which is ozempic. So you can use those three because they have a proven cardiorenal renal benefit for people with MACE in established cardiovascular disease. Okay, that's what this means here. You can also use SGLT2s, canagliflozin, dapagliflozin, empagliflozin. Though um, the best, like, each of those trials had different proportions of secondary versus primary prevention. So Jardians had 100% secondary prevention. So that's the one that I use for people with established cardiovascular disease. Uh, that one or in Volcana, which had 60% of the people who had 60% secondary prevention and 30% primary prevention. 
And dapagliflozin, which is Forziga, had 100% primary prevention. So that one has the least evidence for secondary prevention. So typically, I would use uh, that Jardians or Invocana for people who for secondary prevention. So that's this part here. So CKD. For, uh, for CKD, um, SGLT2s are the, are the recommended one. And then for risk, uh, for this one, risk factors, 60 years or over with severe risk factors, it says GLP ones, but really the only one that's really been studied in primary prevention is dulaglutide, which is trulicity. So that's the one I would use for that one. Mm. And this for heart failure, heart failure, you can see that all of the SGLT2s made an improvement with heart failure. And for progression for neuropathy, all of them help with neuropathy. And nephropathy, sorry. So um, it, there's more evidence in if they have CKD, but if they have, you know, previously established cardiovascular disease, you can still use these ones with great B evidence, the SGLT students with great B evidence to improve their outcomes. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Okay, does that, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, got it. Okay, I'm going to mute you, you're echoing. Okay, uh, so I'll continue on. Use figure two, yes, that is in this update, thanks. Uh, yes, GLP ones help with primary prevention. Really, that's only been shown with Trulicity. And then, yes, yeah, some of the SGLT2s work for secondary prevention. Okay, thank you for clarifying that, Catherine. Yeah, I know it's a lot of stuff to remember, Akash. <laughs> okay, quick question. Now, starting basal bolus in figure three, does some start with basal, then, yeah. But there's not, nothing where you, where you have to do it that way. So you can definitely do bolus. Okay. For initial basal bolus, there's 11. Yes, it can be considered, but again, in the case of Dr. Stephen Strange, you would definitely be better with a bolus. Yes, definitely. Again, the guidelines are guidelines. They're not laws. You need, the most important thing is to develop experience and develop your own clinical judgment, obviously. Twin Desmond. Hello. Hi, sorry to interrupt. Would it be possible if you had the chat up or you read the question? I'm just having a hard time following along with okay. what part of the chat you're responding to. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, can you see? Can you see this? The no, chat? I'm still seeing the. Um... Oh. oh, I guess you can't see my chat. That's a problem. Um, okay, here. Give me one sec. Let me try. Sorry. Thank you. I'm trying to follow along with the chat sure. on my end, but. <laughs> okay, so, um, hmm, how do I do this? Okay, so what I'll do is I'll, do, I'll try copying and pasting the question from the chat and kind of answering it as I go. Okay. Okay, thank you. Sorry, there's just a lot of comments and stuff like that. Um, so Christy says twin popsicle on that handout is listed as well, 15 grams. Um, some various questions. We'll type, okay, here's one. Will type two of remission be on the exam? So the answer is no, I asked. I thought it would be, but apparently it's not. I asked them, it's right here. And they emailed me back saying that it's not going to be on the exam. Okay, what else is on it? Um, stay safe when you have diabetes and six, has twin popsicles, has 15 grams. So I guess the consensus is, is that it's two bars for the, for the dreaded popsicle question. That's what I'm going through. 13 new messages, okay. Uh, um, there's no screening for Correct. So Nada has a question about screening and type one diabetes. 
uh, can't be taken anyway. Yeah, we don't really understand what triggers it, what causes it. So there is no prevention or things like that to uh, to search for. So there's no screening or anything like that. Um, okay. Christy has another question about studies. She's asking about other than DCTT, UK PDS. Um, there's some questions on the today's study, which was the uh, treatment of youth, type two diabetes in youth. Um, people always ask me, you know, will the studies about, uh, Will the studies about like Carolina and all the like the DP four ones and Canvas and stuff like that? I haven't seen that on the I haven't seen that on the exam. Um, to what I think is important to let me just find it first. Where is that in the guidelines? Yeah. So these kind of things. People always wonder if I need to you know memorize this. So the answer is no. Um, what I think you need to know from these is that. It's kind of summarized in that table that up here. Um, for for example, all the DPP, DPP4s, they show no cardiac, cardiac benefit. You do, do need to know which ones have cardiac benefit for these ones, and they are highlighted in red here. So yeah, so that's what I would do. I, I don't think you need to memorize like the study, who was in the Canvas trial, who was in the sustain trial, what was the patient population, stuff like that, and things like that. Yeah. Uh, sorry, hey, uh, Mimi, you had your question, your hand up for a long time. So, oh, and I'll get Samsung if I've answered your question right. I'll get you to put down your hand. Uh, Mimi, if you're still there, I'll get you to unmute and I'll let you answer your question. Yeah, hi. Um, hi, Esmond. Hi. Yeah, um, just uh, I was uh, going over the um, the medication quiz again. There mm -hmm. was a question about the uh, uh, diabetic patients with retinopathy, pre existing retinopathy. Mm -hmm. And I, I am aware of the early worsening risk of um, with the insulin and GLP-1 agonist. Um, but if there, it's if it's on the exam, if there are two answers and GLP-1 and insulin, like I guess the best answer is GLP-1 insulin because I could not find that the um, they mentioned about insulin use. Um, with the uh, early worsening from guidelines. I know that DCCT study and things, and then they mention about with uh, um, intensive therapy, it mm -hmm. could happen. So I'm just, yeah. Yeah, so um, Dr. Jane talked about that. Uh, basically it was because GLP-1s uh, decreased the, insulin, the sugar so quickly, sometimes that can lead to some mm -hmm transient transient wor worsening of retinopathy. Um, I believe he mentioned that there were in insulin studies where they were very aggressive, they saw that too. Yeah. Um, so in real, okay, so in real life, either one, you would go slow to try to prevent that yeah. transient worsening. Mm -hmm. For the exam, I guess technically, um, because GLPs were mentioned to have it and insulin wasn't, yeah. then you would just go with insulin. I, if, if, yeah. GLP-1? Uh, no. Uh, so in in the guidelines, insulin wasn't mentioned as worsening retinopathy. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. like like it, yeah. So to avoid any med like medication, I guess the answer would be GLP one. Yeah. Uh, no. So if like if the person has pre existing retinopathy. Yeah. Then... So which one should you avoid? Or, yeah. Of, avoid. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Avoid. You avoid GLP one, but you use yeah. it for the exam. Yeah, that world. was on the quiz. Yeah, your quiz. So I was um, okay. Yeah. Because I chose just GLP one. I was thinking about insulin, that, but oh no. But what about type one? Then they can really use insulin. Then what's going to happen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for the exam, you do that, but in real life, you just titrate to yeah. lower. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, can I ask a quick question about yeah, like one more question? So that. There was also a quiz that also it's the same question about the statin and the fever, uh, pheno, uh, phenofibrate. Mm -hmm. Because of the myopathy, I select that one and also the um, 
yeah, for to avoid with the um, uh, I think the phenofibrate or gamfibrozil. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was on quiz as well, but the answer was only the lepagalinide. Right. Yes, the, there's an interaction between lepagalinide and, uh, here, let me show you. It's on my medication cheat sheet. Yeah. yeah. Let's see here. Yeah, that's, I do know that lepagalinide has interaction with the clopidogrel mm -hmm. and gamfibrozil. But the question also had the answer of statin. And I do know that the statin has the interaction with the gamfibrozil. Uh, no. Oh, is it the phenofibrate? No, like gem phenofibrates are fibrates and statins mm -hmm. are statins. They're kind of different uh, classes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Like yeah, okay. I was confused. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, thanks. Yep, no problem. Okay. Yeah. Um, here, why don't I just get the people... Uh, here, let me just answer some questions and I'll get to you hash B. Okay, so let me copy and paste it from the chat so that you can see what I see. I guess you don't see all the bubbles that I see. Okay, um, let's go to the chat. Can you confirm if it's 30% or 10% uh, for people who have major depressive? Michelle says 10%, 30% uh, of small depressive conditions. Yeah. So there's like there's things like dysphemia and stuff like that uh, that they lump it into depressive symptoms, but um, the criteria for major depressive disorder is 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 more bigger than that. So yeah, thanks. Thanks for everyone for helping me answer that. Non-clinical question. How do we use the room scan for Proctorio with a desktop computer like iMac? Um, so it's kind of difficult. So you just lift your laptop up and be like me and like spin around like that. It's kind what of, the, it's kind of What is the answer for the major depressive? Uh, Suresh, I, if you're talking, it's your, someone's uh, echoing. So I'm just gonna mute that. And if you do have a question, you can put up your hand and okay. I'll answer you ask your hash B Suresh. Uh, on the on Zoom. Um, okay, let me finish with these questions and then I'll get to you, Hash B. Uh, can you comment on liver disease as a risk factor for hypoglycemia? Um, this was a question in your practice as well. Uh, I believe, if, I don't remember that particular question, Catherine. Uh, why don't you email to me afterwards and I'll discuss, and I'll discuss it with you. Uh, worsening retinopathy with glycine shifts, type one or just, I think it'll be both, yes. So that's, Brianne is asking if it's just type one or type two, and it is both. Oh, okay, because I just see that Shane um replied with the guidelines and that's where I had saw it too that it just says in type one so I wanted to clarify if it was both type one and type two well, the guidelines it only says type one how does it it would be type two because you yeah. wouldn't use the LP ones in type ones yeah so it should it should be both okay okay um so we need to yeah, uh, yes, so you need to physically move the webcam around the room and show that everything, that there's no like posters or questions and stuff like that, including the ceilings and walls, as you mentioned. Um, do you happen to have the answer key for Essentials Edition 4 for that exam? Yes, I do. It is right here. Um, um, here, oops. It is right here. Oh, is that fifth edition? Oh, then I do not have it. Uh, that's that's an old one, and uh, yeah, you, I do not have, I do not have that one's really old too. That was from two thousand eight, so you wouldn't want to use that one anyway. Um, let's see here. Okay, so Hash B, your turn. Awesome. Thanks a lot uh, for doing no that. 
Um, so I think I was getting a little confused today while I was just kind of wrapping up my studying on the um, amount of times you test your blood sugars per day based on the amounts of insulin you're taking, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I just wanted some clarification on that. And I, I think I, like I used the updated version, right? The, um, okay. at the end of the study guide. Um, so like insulin, if you're taking one a day, you would test one a day. Anything okay. more than that, you would test three a day. Okay. So let me see here. Uh, yes. Um, yeah, I know that that's a, the old guidelines were actually, I feel clearer for that. So um, yes. So basically if you, uh, if it's once you use once, you use once a day. And if you have any more, you would do it three times per day. That is different from the old guidelines. And so, but yeah, that is, that is confusing. <laughs> right. And then, um, because then it, within the gray box there on the text, it talks about, you know, if you're on uh, no insulin with medications um, and you're not, not a target doing a seven point profile, if you're doing well, not recommended. Yeah, that right. would, that would, again, that would, yeah, that, is, that definitely is confusing. They should have, what they should have done is they should have did a, um, Kind of like a, you know, like in the old guidelines, they had that nice table to memorize. I don't know why they didn't make another. Well, one. yeah, and that was great, and that's what I was using initially. And I was like, oh, geez, it's it's updated right on the on the newer one. So, and then just the last question on that chapter was just regarding the um, stuff about the time and range, below range and above range. Any suggestions on what to know for that topic? Um, I would I would probably memorize these ones. Hmm. Uh, it's a new chapter, so I think it'll probably show up on the exam. Right. Uh, but yeah, so, but this is newer, so I haven't had, yeah, people haven't had a lot of feedback on that. Awesome. Thanks a lot. No problem. No problem. Okay. So here, I'll go back to the chat. Oh, Suresh, did you have a question? Uh, can you hear me? Uh, you're really, really, really echoey. Oh, okay. I can't no. really hear you because there's a big echo. Okay, now it is clear? Uh, better, yeah. Yeah, so question is, uh, I asked that in the other, uh, uh, other chat. Uh, this uh, glucagon nasal spray, will it come in the, in, in, well, supposed to know anything about it? Uh, yeah, so back back semi is a nasal glucagon. Um, it is much more convenient than injectable glucagon. Like there's lots of studies that show that people uh, find it easier to use. Like even when you train someone to do an injection, if you're not a healthcare professional, you're nervous and stuff like that. And so uh, people have used glucagon. Studies have shown that people it's just easier to use and uh, people use it more effectively with nasal glucagon, yeah. Mm -hmm. so any special does that, does that answer your question, Suresh? Yeah, yeah. So there is any any special dosage in that or just one one um, dosage per thing yeah, machine exactly. per per container. Okay. Okay. All right, so here, um, let me go back to the chat then, and let me copy and paste the questions. Okay. Oopsies. Oh, here. Okay. Uh, here, let me just go to the chat. Where are we? Um, yeah, you, you, They'll be scanning you all over, so don't, don't have, don't be, make sure you have your clothes on and everything and stuff like that. There is a, there, they will be watching you. Okay, uh, 181 table, do not use gemfibrazole in combination with statin. Okay, then I rarely use gemfibrazole, so use phenofibrate instead. Oh, let me copy and paste that, sorry. Uh, bye -bye. 
three eggs a day, yes. So three eggs a day for insulin injection, one eggs daily. What is the seven point pro? Oh, okay, perfect, yeah. Before, so it's fasting and then before and after each meal and at bedtime, that's a seven time thing. Do we need to know all of them um, for the beyond the basics? So you, there, I wouldn't memorize all of them, but I'll try to memorize some of the common ones like bread and stuff like that. Bread, apples, juice, things like that. You know, it's, it's hard to memorize all of them, but there will be lots of questions saying like, okay, this, this patient's taking two apples, a three ginger snaps. How, here's his insulin to carb ratio. How much insulin do you give him? Or this person's sick and he needs 15 grams of carbs per hour. He, how much, how many popsicles or whatever do you give them per, per hour? Yeah. Okay. Um, why do they call it a seven point if it's eight tests? Uh, so it's before and after each meal, which is six, and then bedtime, which is seven. Okay. I'm just going through the chat. Uh, hypertension assessment for kids. They, I do have a cheat sheet on that. It is right here. Oopsies. So make sure you, so it's important to use all parts of my website as well. Uh, make sure that you're using full quizzes. You're trying, you're trying to aim for about like 90% for the quizzes. You know, there, there are lots of things in the how to study section as well. Competencies, um, the exam form, I'll get you tonight. There's tons of questions there. But most importantly, there are cheat sheets. And the screening is right here. So just memorize that. So I went through that. Sorry, I'm just interrupting. Oh, yeah, what's yeah I went through that. So one of the quizzes, but like I, I have the cheat sheet, I was going through that. It okay. is clear. It's supposed to be twice, but one of the quizzes in one of those practice exams, it was once, and that's what got me confused. Oh, I'm like, okay. why is this it once? Okay, I'll look at I'll look at the quiz afterwards. Maybe that's a little on my part. Yeah. So well, yeah, I'm I like, I was using that. I <laughs> prepared it, and I'm like, oh, that's okay. I'll I'll take a look tonight. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll confirm that. Okay, so um, just going through the chat, and we have three minutes left. Um, but also, so I do want to mention, I, I'm just experimenting with this. I do have, as you can see, I have some uh, virtual Q&A sessions. Well, not, not Q&A, just virtual office hours where you can just drop in and ask questions. So they're here. I have tomorrow and uh, Friday off. So nine to 10, four to five, if this, I'll change this to online if I'm online. So you can just jump in, ask questions, things like that. I want you all to have a chance to chat with me. Um, so, you know, if I run out of time today and you still have questions, you can try finding me at one of, one of these times. Okay, so I've got another question to do here. Dean uh, Elderly. Um, they seem like good choices. I don't, I haven't read the uh, elderly chapter lately, but that uh, would be, those would be good choices in those cases. Let me just take, see if I can take a quick look at that. Because yeah, well, even with metformin, it usually doesn't lead to a lot of weight loss. So that's 283, let's find out. Okay. So there's some information here. In general, you want to avoid like uh, sulfonylureas if you can. Yeah, and you, you would use glycoside or even glinotide instead of glyburide to reduce the risk of lows. But it, it doesn't actually recommend that. So. Yeah, I think in an older person, you can use metformin or a DPP-4 would be would be a reasonable option. Yeah. Okay. 
Wait, are you talking to me? 286 below? Um, where are we talking about? Okay, in older people with obesity and type two, could involve agents, yeah, to involve metformin resistance, just like metformin. So another one you, that, another medication that improves uh, insulin resistance is pinplidazone, but you generally are not use it in the elderly because um, it can, has that weird bone thing with osteoporosis that I talk about in the cheat sheet. Yeah. Okay. okay it's Mond um yeah. Just can I interrupt you? Yeah, what's up? Just the 286, the four elderly, lean elderly people or drug of choice, is it that they recommend the initial therapy for these individuals could include agents that so like such as a DPP4 inhibitors? Yeah, I think metformin or DPP4 would be a good choice. Okay. So I just was uh, clarifying. So for lean older people, um, it's DPP-4 inhibitor. And for older people with obesity, uh, they recommend um, metformin because of uh, the possible reason would be um, insulin resistance. Um, yeah, like it, this is just a consideration. Kind of, like, okay. yeah, like they didn't even put it in the recommendation. So it's not even... Okay. Yeah, you yeah. in real life you could use either or. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Yeah. yeah. All right, thank you. Okay, okay. So at six forty one, um, I just want to quickly uh, go through things, and then if you do have further questions, you can meet me in my office hours or put an exam forum. Um, at what Karim is asking, at what weight? what weight should basal insulin be started less? Um, it kind of depends, like it's 0 0.1 or 10 units. Like if they're really frail, like if they're under 50, 50 kg, like they're like 100 pounds, I would, or 100, 100 or so pounds, I would start less just to be safe. I thought I stated one cup of mushroom potatoes is 57 grams of carbs. Um, I don't know where that is. That's here somewhere. Uh, just to be clear, would you, I'm on Shane Brace's question at 626, would you only test seven times one day? No, it would be a couple times just to kind of establish a pattern. Those guidelines are talking about trying to like see where is, is where's it high, where's it low. And, uh, but it's not like you don't have to do it every day because the patient wouldn't agree to that. Um, okay. Just going through things. It is. Okay, there's like way too many questions here. Um, so if you do have more questions, please, it's a six for sure here. Uh, and there's like 20 emails and every 20 messages here. I can't do it through all of them. But if you do have additional questions, please post them in the exam form or see me during uh, the, my virtual office hours. Uh, those again, that is just right here. I'll be online tomorrow morning and I will try to get through the exam forum tonight to answer all those questions for all the people who are writing tomorrow. Yeah, so um, again, just to wrap up, uh, good luck with the exam. Uh, make sure you keep calm. That's the most important thing. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll open up the exam forum for the post exam form afterwards. And uh, you can kind of discuss how, how you felt the exam was and go from there. Yeah. So uh, yeah, good night and best of luck with your study. Oh, and I will record this and go from there. Okay, well, let's stop this and get going. Why isn't this stopping?
Ta, ta, ta. Ja, det 